<laughs> no, because you know your grade can only your grade reflects your academic performance. So as much as I appreciate your surface, it is not a part of your grade. But it's okay because you're paying attention. So I think you're going to get a good, reasonable grade anyway. So, all right. So now we are recording the screen. So there'll be three video recording today. Okay, the first one with the wrong screen size, the second one, the screen didn't work, and then this is the third one where everything is indeed working. <clears throat> All right, so here we go. So we're going to do the usual thing. We push the return address. So now I'm using this you know, new way of doing it. We did this last week already. I hope you guys remember. So we are basically just computing the return address based on the address of the LDI instruction on line three. So this way, we don't need to define a new label just for that purpose. Then we have to push it on the stack. So pushing something on the stack means we decrement the stack pointer and store to whatever the stack point is pointing to after the decrement. So in this case, register A has the right value to push, which is just the return address. And then we, con we continue with a branch to the function that we are calling, which is main. And when that returns, we hold because there's nothing to do. After main return, after main returns. All right. So at this point, we can now define the two functions in any order we want. But I'm going to preserve the order as in the C code. So we have post in here. But this time, I want to draw the stack first. Okay. I want to find out what I'm supposed to be seeing on the stack. So we have one parameter, which is p var. It is pushed by the caller, and then we have the return address, which is also pushed by the caller. And since pvar is pushed first, it has a high address. Return address is pushed last by the caller, so it has a lower address. But now, we also, we're also supposed to have reserved a space for the return value, which is the job of the callee. So when everything is done, I want the stack pointer to be pointing here. But it's not pointing there yet. So the entry point of the subroutine, even though this is what the stack should look like, the stack pointer is only pointing here. So that means, hmm, I think the function needs to do something about this situation. In other words, the return value does not have a space reserved for it yet on the stack, and we want it to be on the stack. So that means the next thing we need to do is to reserve that space. So decrement D is going to reserve the space for the local variable, which is um, return value. And then later on, you know, when when we're about to return, we have to increment the stack pointer so that we deallocate the local variable before the actual return to the caller. And then we have the usual uh, pop return address, which is the LDBD, increment D, and then JMPB. Okay? So at this point in time, I'm hoping that everybody can look at line 18, 19, and 20 and just recognize and go like, oh, that's just returning to the caller. Because we have been talking about this for two classes already at least you know, last week. So that means you know, we, have to be, we should be able to recognize those three as one single operation, which is returning to the caller. Yes? OK, so let's see what we should do when we do not remember something that we have talked about. I can briefly, briefly describe that. But what we should all do is to go back and say, OK, it was something that we talked about last week. So go back to the lecture from last week and watch that. Or read the assembler manual, because it's also described there. The dot notation? In where, where are you looking? Canvas. Canvas? No, I said you know, the assembler manual. Yep, so I would look up the assembler manual. It is also in the lecture last week. So the dot is the address of the LDI instruction on line three. And the halt instruction is six bytes away from it. And the dot six plus is a postfix notation, which I also described last week. All right. So you might want to jot down the notes and go like, okay, I need to go back and check on those things from last week. Um, you can do a quick search, you know, because if you can uh, get to the closed captioning, you can just do a quick search on postfix notation, P-O-S-T-F-I-X, 
Yep. And that can quickly get you to the moment when we start to talk about that. All right. So in between, so the decrement, after the decrement D, what the stack would look like is going to change just a little bit because you know, now we actually have the stack pointer decremented so that it is now actually pointing to um, the return value. And it is good now because everything that is below where the stack pointer points to is susceptible to corruption by the gremlins, okay? You know, magical, mythical, you know, naughty creatures that can corrupt memory. But they only corrupt things that are below where the stack pointer points to and above the last location that you use you know, for your program, okay? So they play by a very strict rule, but anything below, you know, within that range, they can do chain, random changes to any of those bytes. So that's why it is important before we make use of the location that corresponds to the return value, we have to make sure that the stack pointer is at least pointing to that location, possibly lower if you need more stuff, but at least at that point. Are we doing okay so far with that analogy and also why we have to do the decrement D and then they are later on do the increment D because we were, at this point we are exiting the, the function already. There's no need for me to keep the local variable around. So at that point I can go like, okay, you know, we don't need that anymore. So we move the stack pointer back up so that we don't, you know, we don't have to save that. Are we good so far? All right, okay. So at this point on line 19 in the assembly code, we can finally do what we need to do here. But then, you know, I have to keep track of all of this stuff in my mind. So that means, you know, one thing I can do is to use label names as offsets to the individual items that they need access to. In other words, this can be seen as D plus zero, this can be seen as D plus one, and this can be seen as D plus two. Okay, those are the respective addresses of the parameter P var, the return address, and also the local variable return value. So instead of having to remember who is at location zero or at an offset of zero, who is at an offset of two, I'm just gonna use some labels to do that. So the labels allow me to use a symbolic name to refer to these things. So the return value is exactly where the stack point is pointing to, so it is at an offset of zero bytes from where the stack pointer points to. The next item is the return address. The return address is typically not really useful. We don't really have to keep track of that, but it is okay if we want to. So it is one plus whatever offset return value is. And then the next one, the last one, is gonna be our parameter, which is PVAR. It is at one byte past the return address. And this is the reverse Polish notation, which means we specify the value first, and then we decide, we determine what we need to do, what we want to do with the value. So that's why we specify the label, we specify the one, and then we specify, oh, by the way, with those two, add them together. Is that okay so far? All right. <clears throat> So later on, if anyone is interested, I can show you a very systematic way to, to convert mid, I mean, an infix notation to postfix notation. So you can actually give me a long, complicated infix notation expression, and I can systematically convert that into a postfix notation. So if we have enough time today, I can show you guys how to do that. All right, so now we can proceed and say, what do we need to do? Well, looks like we have to compute the right-hand side first, and then we do the dereference. So what we need to do is to get to the PVAR. So the trick to do that is to do LDI. Um, I typically use register C, but you can use any one of the three registers, A, B, or C. So I, tip I typically use register C, but you can use some other ones. So the first thing is we load it with the offset to access the thing that we want. So in this case, we want to access PVAR, so we load the offset to PVAR from where the stack pointer points to into register C. And then we add the stack pointer to register C. Okay? And then at this point, I claim that C is, the, uh, is basically the address of PVAR. It is the address of the parameter PVAR. So when you look at line 7 in the C code, 
do we are we really trying to refer to the address of p var? No, nope. it's it's one of the steps that we need to get to what we want. But what we really want is what p var is pointing to. But before we get to p what p var is pointing to, we first need to get to p var itself. But at this point, we only have the address of p var. So what do we need to do next? We reference it. Very good. Okay, so we have to dereference register C. Okay, so we can say LDCC. So now C is the dereference of the address of P var, which means it is just P var itself. Okay, because dereference is canceling the address of these two operators. Basically, are counterparts. They do the opposite effect. But that is still not what I want on the right-hand side because at this point we just got to pvar, which is the value of the parameter itself, which is a pointer. What I really want to get to is the thing that pvar is pointing to. So what do we need to do again? Okay, that that last word in the previous sentence tells you exactly what we need to do. But I still want you guys to tell me what it is. What do we need to do now? Register C has p var, but what the right hand side of the assignment needs is what p var is pointing to. So what do we need to do at this point? Come on, you guys know the answer. I know some of you know the answer. You're just not telling me. We need to the reference one more time. Okay, so. All right, so we can do that. So LD, C, C, just one more time. Okay, you know, I cannot type today. There we go. So now C is, okay, I'm just giving you the whole thing, okay, which is just whatever P var is pointing to. All right, so finally we have the right hand side of the assignment. It's time to compute the address of the left hand side, which is the address of return value. So we do the same thing, except we have to use a different register. LDI, eh, we'll use register B this time. Posting underscore return value, add register D to register B. So at this time, B has the address of return value already, and that's all we need, okay? Well, not exactly, but you know, we don't do any dereferencing. Well, okay, I take it back. We do do a dereference, but this time it is a store. Because register B contains the address of where we need to store the right-hand side, and the register C has the right-hand side. So a single store operation is going to complete the entire line of return value is whatever P var is pointing to, which is line 7 of the C code. Are we still doing okay so far at this point? Okay, so I'm just going to say, as far as the subroutine is concerned, this is all I'm going to do right now. In fact, I'm going to put a halt instruction here just so that I can stop right there. I can look at the snapshot of the stack and make sure that things are happening the way it is supposed to. But I also need to finish main in order to test the program. So here's main. Main is now a regular subroutine. So I, need, I have a return address, which is pushed by the caller. The caller of main has no name. It's just the entry code of the entire program. But main is also supposed to have two local variables. So it has y and an x. And at this point, okay, at the entry point of main, the stack pointer is only pointing to the return address. I have not reserved the space for x or y as local variables. So that means the next thing we need to do is to decrement D twice. Because we decremented once for Y, we decremented one more time for X. I did not write the comments in the program because I think it would be a very good exercise once I give you this code to put in the comments the way you want to describe it. Okay? So when you watch the video, okay, you'll, I'll be talking about what a particular line is doing, but you don't want to just copy what I said. You want to use your own words to describe what a line is trying to do in the program. So now we have the things uh, all allocated. And this is just my typical programming style, is I would also you know, finish this up with whatever you know, we need at the end of the function. So this way I don't forget. So we have 
uh, LDBB increment D, JMPB, which is the return because main is now just a regular function. It has to return to its own caller. So between these two, I can now say, oh, the stack <clears throat> now looks like this because the stack pointer is no longer here. And instead, it is pointing to X, you know, which is the local variable X of main. And all I want to do is to finish line 16 and then line 17, and then we run the program to make sure that it does what it is supposed to do. All right, so starting with line 16, um, the right-hand side is easy, LDIA with just a constant of three. This is the right-hand side of the assignment. Now we have to compute where is X and how do I store to X? Have we seen something like this already, how to store to a local variable? Okay, because we just did that in post ink, but what I have not done yet is to define the labels that basically gives us symbolic name to the offset to each item on the stack from where the stack pointer points to. So we want to use this picture to compute those particular values. So that means, uh, okay, we have to go back and define those labels. So main x is going to be zero because it is the, the last thing that we allocate on the stack when we invoke main. And then the next item is y. So main underscore y is main underscore x plus whatever x the size of x is. But since x is an unsigned a bit integer, it only takes up one byte on the stack. And then above that, it's not particularly useful, but if you want to designate a label for that, it's okay too. So the return address is one byte after y. So that's how we express the offset to get to the return address of main, which is not really useful because you, know, you, you are not supposed to be messing around with that one. All right, so with all of these labels done, I can now say LDIB with main underscore x, which is the offset from where the stack pointer points to, to local variable x. We add BD, which is now the address. B is now the address of X. And then we do STBA. That completes line 16 of the C code. <clears throat> and then we need to make a call in the, on line 17. So the first thing we need to do is to compute the value of X, which we still have in register B. So we can just push B on the stack right now, which is decrement D. STBB. So right now, you know, I, I'm just pausing a little bit. Right now, we really should be able to understand line 62 and line 63 combined is pushing the value of register B. You know, those two instructions, decrement the stack pointer and then store to whatever the stack pointer points to is how we push a value on the stack. Okay. And then, you know, so you might need to, when you get to this code, you might want to insert a comment on line 61 you know, to say that register B still continues to have the address of X, and that's exactly what we need to push on the stack. So you might want to remind yourself why we do not have to initialize B any further to push it on the stack, because it already has what we need. Do we have any questions about that part? So I am putting in a lot of things for you guys to kind of follow up on as you document this code. But I think that is going to be beneficial as you go over the code and document it. <clears throat> All right, so uh, what else do we need to push on the stack? The return address, okay? Because this is a call to a subroutine. So after we push the arguments, there's only one, we have to push the return address. So right now, you know, we know the usual notation to do it. Um, do commerce. And then we do a push. So, so decrement D, S, T, D, A this time. Now we have pushed the return address. We now continue execution in the subroutine, which is post ink. And then when post ink returns, it will return to whatever instruction I'm going to type on line 71. And at that point, I have to do an increment D because the subroutine, the function, is only responsible to pop the return address. So that means the argument will still be on the stack. It is the responsibility of the caller to deallocate that. So that's why you know, we have increment D on line 71 is to deallocate the argument that is still on the stack right here 
right now at this point. So after that, the value, the return value is in register A, and that's what we need to put into local variable Y. So we do a LDI B, okay? Cannot use A because A still has the return value. So we have to be careful not to use register A on line 73. And it's going to be the offset. Oh, I forgot. Oh, okay. Never mind. I did not. So main underscore Y. This is the offset to local variable Y from where the stack pointer points to. Once we add that offset, to, you know, once we add the stack pointer to the offset, now we have the address of local variable Y of main. And then we just need to store at that point, you know, using the return value of the function call, which is still in register A. And that completes line 17. And then the rest of main is already done. All right, so I think it's time to run this code. But before we do that, we want to know exactly what it is supposed to do. Okay, for a program of this complexity, we should be able to figure out everything before we run it. So that this way we can go like, oh, okay, we know what is supposed to be at that location. We also know what is supposed to be at that location. All right, so to do that part, I'm going to use the tablet to help out a little bit. And I'm just trying to figure out you know, how to show it. Um, I think showing the C code is better than the assembly code because the assembly code is kind of scattered. Um, so I will show the C code along with, um, along with um, the tablet. Right, so let me start up the tablet. <clears throat> Screen copy. Let me see. All right. So I think we should start this time. Yep. All right. So we can show a part, at least a part of the C code and also you know, the, you know, what I'm going to draw on the stack at this point. All right. So the way it works, now you can do this with a spreadsheet. It's even better because you know, it's already a table. But I think you know, with a, yeah, this allows me to do freehand drawing and stuff like that, especially when it comes to pointers. You know, it really helps to draw that. So we have uh, location FF, location FE, location FD, location FC, location FB. I think location FA is the last one we want, but you know, I'll just kind of, just to be sure. So this is the stack. The stack originally is empty, which means the stack pointer is pointing to location 00, zero which also means you know, this, is where the stack pointer is, is quote unquote pointing to initially, but it's okay because every time we push, we decrement the stack pointer first. So that means you know the first location we're actually going to overwrite is going to be location FF because we decrement D before we write to where it points to. So when we look at the program in C, okay, so we're just looking at the C code. In main, we have um, main has its own return address. So the return address from main to the entry code is here. It's taking up that location. That's the very first thing that we push on the stack. There are no arguments, so that's why this is the first thing we push. But after we push that, we reserve the next lo two locations as local variables y and x of, uh, of main. So y is allocated here, x is allocated over here. So those two are local variables of main. Together, these three bytes are considered the frame for main. Okay, so we basically look at these three bytes and say this forms the frame for the invocation of main. There we go. And then what do we do? Well, then we call the subroutine cost post inc. Okay, before we do that, we also put a three into x. So that means location FD should end up with a value of 03 in here by the time we call the function post inc. 
So when we call post when we call post inc, the first thing we push on the stack is the argument, which is the address of x, which is fd. So that means your fd should be the content of location fc. Is that okay? Because fc is the parameter that we call p var of the function post inc. And then we push a return address. So this return address will return to main from post inc. And then we have the local variable return val, you know, return value that we allocate in post inc. So this location is return value, which is a local variable of post inc. It is not of main. Okay. So in this case, these three bytes is the frame of calling post inc. In other words, the, the term frame is referring to contiguous locations on the stack that provides the context of running the code of a function. That's basically what a frame is. So it includes everything, including all the parameters, the return address, and all the local variables. So collectively, that provides us the context of running the code of a function. It is called a frame. All right, so once we get into the function, the first thing we did, okay, was to retrieve whatever pvar is pointing to, and pvar is fd, fd points to, zero, points to a location fd, which has a, the value of 0, 3. So that 0, 3 should be stored in return value, which is lo at location fa, so we should expect 0, 3 to be here by the time we get to the halt instruction. Because that's where we, I put in the halt instruction and go like, okay, let's just say that this is all we want to do at this point. It'll be good so far. And the stack pointer should be pointing to what location? What was the last thing that we allocated on the stack? Hmm? Yep, you're correct. So this is where we expect register D to be pointing to at the halt instruction you know, of the code that I have provided. All right. So the question is, are you guys just going to take my words for it and go like, yeah, Tacky is probably right. No. You always go like, okay, let's, let's check it, right? You know, let's make sure that this is actually happening. And you might be asking, you know, so Tack, how, long, how many times have you rehearsed this? The answer is, zero okay i just write a code you know right right now you know so this way there's a there's a chance that i have written a bug into the whole thing which is great because that gives me a chance to show you guys how to debug a program which i think is a skill that should be taught from cisp 360 unfortunately for, from what i have heard from many students that skill has never been taught in classes which is unfortunate all right, so we're going to change to the folder where uh, River Spider is installed. Okay, so River Spider is a really great tool because it really simplifies the whole process of doing this. So we submit um, ink.ttpasm. That's the name of the assembly file. And before we do that, I'm going to have to make sure I saved it. Yes, I did save it this time. And then we just press the Enter key. So it will upload the code to the assembler into the source tab. It would collect the RAM file, run it in Logisim, collect the trace, upload the trace you know, back to the assembler tool, and then so that it can analyze the trace. So when we get back to the assembler, right, where is it? Here, and then go to the analysis tab. This is reflecting the execution of this program as it is now. So I just need to give you some time to finish processing. You know, this progress bar has to be completely gone before I can trust that you know, what we are seeing is what we should be seeing. And sometimes it takes a little bit of time, like right now, just longer than it really needs. So I think we are good here. Okay. All right, so how do we check? The first thing is, are we looking at the return address to the entry code with this memory write operation? This memory write operation is using C notation, 
zero 09 is the hexadecimal value that is written to the location at FF. So I'm using the asterisk as a dereference operator, which means you know, this is where we are overwriting its location FF. So for that, in order to verify that, we go to the assemble tab, and then we go to you know, where we specify the return address. So indeed, it calculates it to be 09 as the location. And then we double check that the location 09, it is indeed the halt instruction right after the JMPI instruction. So it is the right return address. Okay. So we go back to the analysis tab. Okay. So we just push the return address here. So if you don't want to read the rest, it's okay. Okay. You know, unless something is wrong, then we have to go back. But otherwise, we can just kind of check what is written to RAM, which is the stack. So the next write is a 0, 03, and that is um, the 0, 03 that we put into local variable x of main. So in order to double check whether that makes sense or not, we look at this picture. Um, FD is supposed to have 0, 03 because it is, it is local variable x of main. So, so far, everything is consistent. So we go back here, we look at the next write operation. This is a FC location. The location FC has a value of FD. Does that make sense to us? We look back here. This is location FC. It has a content of FD because that is supposed to be a pointer or the address of X. In other words, if you want to, I'm going to change the color because I think that shows a little bit better. So PVAR is a pointer to the location of local variable X of main. So that is why we see you know, FD as the value at location FC. <clears throat> so getting back here, so the stack is all set up. The next write operation is a 0, 06 to location FB. That is the return value back to, let me check. That's the, that's the return address back to main. And I think that may not be the right thing. It, we are looking at this value here. So we go back to the assemble tab because it just doesn't seem to make sense to me. There will be a, you're probably right. So we want to double check that, right? So we want to look at the call to post ink from main. And then we say, how do we push the return value? Okay. And we dot we specify a six plus without the dot. Okay, so that's why you know it's not giving us the right value. It is just saying, oh, we only get a six because the plus cannot occur because the plus requires two operands. Okay, so we just found a bug, but you can see how I found a bug, right? Because I know I'm supposed to be seeing the return address to main. The return address to main is six bytes from here, and that is supposed to be here which is at location 29. So instead of looking at scene 29, I see 06, I know right away something is not right. Is that okay? So I did put a bug into the whole thing, which is, as I said, great, because it shows you know, how you debug a program for this class. You basically have to make a mental picture of what you should be seeing, you know, be, being you know, this part here, and then when you run the code in Logisim, you basically just compare and go like, okay, did I end up putting 29 into location FB? Nope. Why not? Well, because I got the wrong value into register A. Why? Because the expression was wrong. Is that okay? So this is not just a concept in assembly language programming or computer architecture. It is how you reason things out. Okay. And that is the most important skill that you can learn in today's you know, um, job market. Because of what? Because of AI. Okay? I would say OpenAI can probably out-program half of this class by the time you graduate with a bachelor's degree. Okay? So the question is, how do you not become <laughs> that half of the class. Now, I would love this entire class to be able to out-analyze and out-program you know, AI tools by the time you graduate, because that's why you will be hired, is you can outperform the AI. Okay? But as far as I know, 
open AI, you know, or the chat GPT does not do a whole lot of critical thinking. It cannot reason things out. It appears to be able to do that, but when you actually read how it performs analysis, a lot of times it's baloney. <laughs> but you have to read very carefully to spot you know, those you know, basically you know, BS you know, coming out of you know, generative AI. All right, so we go back and change the program. Okay? Now that we know the program is wrong, okay, we go back and change it. <clears throat> so the idea of programming or becoming a good programmer or effective programmer is not the fact that you do not write bugs into your program. It is the fact that you can find them effectively and fix them quickly. So that becomes you know, the, the focus. It's not that you know, oh, tech does not write anything that, is, that has bugs. Anything that's worth writing will have bugs. So we have to live with it. The question is, can you find those bugs and fix them quickly? All right, so we fix it. We go back here and let it run again. There we go, and then we go back to the trace, and you can see, huh? Yeah, I did. And you can actually see that it is now 2.9. So because I refreshed everything, so now it's 2.9. Okay, so far so good. So 2.9 is what we expect. And so we push 2.9 on the stack, which is the correct return address to main. <clears throat> and then the next operation is to overwrite FA, location FA with a 0, 3. And we check our little hand drawing thing here. Location FA is indeed expected to be overwritten by a value of 0, 3. So now we have verified everything up to and including the halt instruction, which is only placed there so that I can stop the entire program, so I have a place to stop and go like, okay, let's double check everything. Oh, there's one more thing. We also need to double check that by the time we get to the halt instruction, the stack pointer should be pointing to location FA, which is the return value local variable of post ink. So we, we have to go back to the trace and double check that. All right, so what was the last time we updated uh, register D? So we look up the you know, column D because you know, that reflects all the updates to register D or all the registers. So we can see that register D was last updated on, you know, at, with the instruction decrement D over here, and it is indeed an FA. So that's how we debug a program at this point. Now you can probably say, so what if I have a program that is much longer? You don't write a long program in one single shot. That's the only answer to that thing, is you write it step by step. You write a little bit, you check. Write, write a little bit, you check again. So this way, you know, you don't have to debug a huge long program knowing that the bug can be anywhere. So at this point, I can go back to the code in assembly, and I can now say, I know that everything is working all the way up to the halt instruction that I put into post ink which is here. And I can proceed at this point without worrying that, did I have the right you know, argument push on the stack? Did I have the right return value on the stack? Did I adjust the stack pointer to allocate for the local variable correctly? Did I retrieve the right thing to put into the local variable return value? I don't have to worry because I double checked everything already. So at this point, if, a, if the program doesn't work, it has to be the additional code that I put into the program at this point. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's how you would write your code too, because you're gonna have some homework assignment um, today. It is something that you cannot get done during the lab, and I'll give you until next Monday to turn it in. Yes, I know we have you know, Thanksgiving in between, but still. <laughs> I think between you know, getting your Thanksgiving meal and all the other stuff, you can find some time to work on this program. Anyway, getting back to this, okay, so now we get to line eight, okay, so we need to do what line eight is supposed to do. Um, so we need to get to P bar, and I don't have, I don't have the, um, I don't have the value of P bar anymore, so I'm gonna have, I have to recompute it, but that's just, you know, just repeating some code that we have written already. So this is the offset from where the stat pointer points to, to the local variable to the parameter pvar. C now has the address of pvar, 
which is um, good, but we need the value of PVAR. So the value of PVAR needs one D reference, so LD CC. So C is now PVAR itself. I'm going to stop here. And then we need to dereference PVAR to get you know, this value that we are going to add one to. I'm not going to clobber register C this time because I need it back later on. So I'm going to use another register. I can use register A at this point. Register A has no particular meaning at this point. But I can also use register B. Eh, I'm just going to pick A. It's OK. So now register A has whatever PVAR is pointing to. Register C continues to be PVAR itself. Okay, so I do not write any comments here. And if you ask me, can Tech, can you really track all this stuff? The answer is yes. When I'm working on the program, okay. Fifteen minutes later, I look at the same code. I go like, I have no idea what this is. Okay, so that means it is also important for you to write comments as you write your code for the homework assignment. Okay, because when you're working on it, yes, you can probably track. Oh, this register has this, that register has that. But after 15 minutes, <laughs> you cannot track that anymore because I cannot track it either. So it's important to put in comments into the program. All right, so register C has PVAR, register A has whatever PVAR is pointing to, which means the one I increment is A because that is representing what PVAR is pointing to. And then I store that A back to whatever C is pointing to because register C is still PVAR, so I need to store the entire right hand side back to whatever the left hand side is, you know, the location of the left hand side, which is still in register C. So that should complete line eight of the C code. And then we have to return P, uh, return value in register A. So at this point, I just do the LDI A with post ink underscore return value, add AD, which get to the address of return value, do a D reference. And now register A is the return value itself, which specifies the return, the actual value to return of the return statement. And we are done. All right. So at this point, we look at the main subroutine and make sure that that part is also done correctly because I might have forgotten to do. Yep, I forgot. OK, because I just you know, do the post ink to do the call. It um, increments, increment, okay, that's for deallocating. And I store everything back into Y. So the whole program is done. Okay, okay. So if the whole program is done, before I actually test run it, I have to complete this picture, which means when the function returns, the side effect of calling post ink is incrementing X from 0, 3 to 0, 4. So let me pick a different color. About you know so that I can I can see what differences I should be seeing this time. <clears throat> okay, so that means the side effect of calling post ink is to change that zero three to zero four, and then after that, the return value is supposed to be zero three, which should be in register A. That value should then be used to update local variable y of main, which is at location F E. So we should see this location to be changed to 0, 3. So the red line is indicating things that are different this time. These are the additional stuff that we should see after we added the additional code and taking out the halt instruction. Are we still OK with this demonstration? OK, all right. So now we go back to the tool. OK, so make sure we save the code. And then we run the code again. <clears throat> the nice thing about using um, the trace tool is the cursor in that particular sheet is maintained, which means you know, if you know the program is up working up to a certain point, you can just you know, go further down you know, from that point. So now we go back to um, the trace. And then we continue with this, right? You know, so we just look at. Um, what we are returning. All right, so we checked this already. But we also have to check that we are returning the correct value. Did we check that? All 
I'm just trying to remember, you know, when did we stop last time? I think we stopped with um, knowing that stack pointer is FA, and that we put 0, 3 into FA, which is the local variable return value. So we can now continue with our you know, thing here. Uh, this 2 is the offset. This is the address of P var. And then this is the referencing. OK, this is the address of P var. This is the value of P var, which points to local variable x of main. And this is the value of local variable x of main. We add one to it, and then we store that back to local variable x of main, which is at location fd. Okay, so um, it's hard to see that unless you have this map here. So it's nice to have a map that you will draw on the side as you go through the trace. So we can look at location fd. Location fd is indeed local variable x of main. Okay, so we basically just double check that, that the increment operation is done correctly in the C code. So what we are talking about is we just verified that line 8 works the way it's supposed to. <clears throat> so moving ahead with the trays. Um, moving on. So, so now we return the value of the local variable return value, and that is a 3. And then we go through the, um, we deallocate the local variable so that local variable return value is now deallocated. And then we do the usual return sequence. And then we continue execution in main with uh, 3 as a return value. And then inside main, the first thing we do is to increment D, which means we're deallocating the argument, which is the address of X, which is still sitting on the stack. We deallocate it so that now the stack pointer points back to local variable x of main. This is the offset to get to y, to y. This is the address of y. And then we store the return value of calling post inc to y. So y is now updated to 0, 3, which in the picture is exactly what we expect to do. Um, location FE should change to 0, 3. It's in red because these are the things that we just added. Okay, these are the operations that I allow to execute at this point. And then at that point, we finish basically the whole program. We deallocate the two local variables. So the stack pointer is now back, back to pointing to the return address to the entry code of the entire thing. And then we make use of that return address. This is the return sequence. Then we go back to the entry, the entry code of the entire thing, which now only has a halt instruction. And then the stack pointer is balanced because it is back to location 0, 0. All right, so that's a long trace of this program. Do we have any questions? I know it's really long, and there are a few concepts. But the real new concept that we have introduced in today's class is just local variables. Because we talked about parameters, which are based. So it's from the perspective of the function being called, they're called parameters. From the perspective of the caller, they're called arguments. So arguments is what the caller specifies for the parameters from the callee's or the function's perspective. Uh, we talked about the return address already. So today's you know, we, the, the real technique that we talk about today, which is a technique, it is not a concept, is how we utilize <clears throat> the definition of these labels so that this way I don't have to maintain that mental picture of, oh, two bytes from where the stat pointer points to is blah, blah, blah. Okay, I can just use the label name, which is a whole lot easier to refer to when I'm translating the C code into assembly code. All right, so do we have any questions? All right, so I'm going to give you guys a little bit of time to make a copy of the assembler right now. So if you were to sign in and go to the assembler right now, you can go to File and then make a copy. So this way, you don't have to redo everything the way that I did. I mean, you're welcome to do it if you want to. But since already done, so the source tab is consistent 
with the analysis tab right now. The source tab is indeed the code that is running, and then the analysis tab is what happens when you run the code. So for studying purposes, this spreadsheet can be helpful. Um, one way to study is to look at this trace and then use column H or beyond to help um, comment what is happening with each instruction. Why is it here? What does it do? What does it, how does it relate to the C code, okay? Um, how does it relate to how we utilize the stack in a call frame? So, you know, use one of those columns. You know, use column H, I, J, K, you know, I don't care which one, because those are not used by the assembler itself. It's not used by the assembler structure itself. So you can add any comment you want to, you know, in column H, I, J, K, and so on. And you can just, you know, save this particular spreadsheet and don't use it as an assembler any further. Just use it as a documentation tool. Okay, you know, this is the program. This is the outcome. And this is the trace. And these are my explanation of what is going on as each instruction executes. So that's one activity that I think will be helpful. The other one is once I upload the, um, the code here, both the C code and the assembly code, comment the assembly code. Okay, you'll make sure that you comment, I would say, every single line at this point of the class. Okay, because you know, before you can recognize and go like, oh, I know what's going on here. At some point, you will be able to do that. But at this point, I would just comment every single line so that you know, okay, this line is here because of this reason. It is a part of blah, blah, blah. And that in return is corresponding to which line in the C code. So that is how you can uh, relate the assembly code to the C code and also relate to the caller callee agreement at the same time. I would say that's a really good way to spend 160 minutes because for each hour in the lecture, you're supposed to spend two, twice that amount of time for you know, understanding the material and you know, just kind of working on it. That's how, we would how I would study for this class at this point. It's not so much what you're reading, it is how much you are commenting and relating. All right. So I think I'm going to leave this you know, around for some time, okay? So if you have not made a copy yet, I would try to get to it as soon as possible. <clears throat> all right, with all that said, I'm going to take roll today. Yeah, I know it's kind of late in the semester to take roll, but it is still important for me to take roll. If not for anything, I want to collect you know, statistics about you know, how often people come to class, you know, how does that affect the grade? Does it even affect the grade? <clears throat> because in some cases, it does not. But I would say in general, it does. All right, so you should be able to see the row activity for today. And the access code is local for local variable. Because that's what we did. And then once you are done with this, I'll describe what we're going to do in today's lab section and then what else you also need to do over, you know, until next Monday. Alrighty, so I'm guessing most of you are done with the road taking activity. So I will proceed to talk about your know, today's lab, you know, what you need to do in today's lab and what you have to accomplish over the weekend by next Monday.
All right. So today's lab would be these two activities. So uh, parameters and return value is one that is are the two activities. So let me open up a new tab so you can see the access code. So the access code for the first activity is frame. And I already know what the next one is. So the first one is frame. The second one is framed. Okay. So those two are for today's, you know, what you need to do in today's lab, lab section. And then what you need to do over the weekend are these two, your function calls and function call your program submission. So let me open these two up. I'm taking the um, access code away because it is a homework assignment. So the first thing I need to change is to change it from lab to homework. It used to be a lab activity, but I'm turning it into a homework so you have more time. And we're going to show the answer on April 20, 27th, which is next Monday um, before class. Sorry? Oh. <laughs> That's right. November 27th, and it's going to be right before class, so 10.30 a.m. And that's also going to be the due date, which is November 27th at 10.30 a.m. November 27th at 10.30 a.m. And I'm taking away the access code, so this way no one is going to call me and try to get me and go like, what is the access code again? There we go. So that's kind of a quiz, you know, more or less like you know, what you normally do in a lab. And then the other one is the program submission because you're supposed to actually finish a program. So I'm going to make some changes here too. So once again, this is now homework. And then the due date is same time, which is um, November 27th right before the class starts. There we go. And this one has no access code to begin with, so you should be fine here. Save and publish. There we go. <clears throat> All right. I'm just getting back to Canvas to make sure everything looks right here. All right, so Parameters and return value is what you need to do in today's lab section. Uh, call frame is also the same thing, but these two are mostly um, multiple choice and fill in the blanks, you know, kind of thing. Um, the homework function calls is also mostly um, multiple choice, but it gives you pointers and instructions of how to complete the homework assignment, which you have to turn in, which is actually programming in that case. All right. Do we have any questions? Because if not, I will also spend just a little bit of time to talk about GitHub or a revision tracking tool or revision control tool. No questions at this point? OK. So one thing you might want to look into, I know it's just one more thing that you have to look into, is to look into GitHub or using a Git tool. I'm a command line kind of person, so I don't really use the GUI interface or the web interface. You can, you can use Git, G-I-T, as a, as a tool without having to use GitHub or to register for an account. So the way I do it on the command line, now this is also just kind of, I'm not sure how many people would do it this way, but I can do it this way, and I typically do it this way too. So the way I do it is in the folder where I have all the files, I would use your Git init. And that would initialize the folder to get ready for get the tool to track the revisions. So let me just kind of give you an example. I will make a new folder test. Oh, it's already there. Test directory. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing you do is you say get init, which would initialize the folder you know, so that it's ready for tracking revisions. Then you can go ahead and create your program. So I'm just going to say uh, swap.ttpsm. And I'm just going to put a no op instruction here and call this the first revision. Save the file, and then you say get add swap.ttpasm. 
So that's going to add the file into the repository, or at least it's telling get the tool and go like, OK, this is one of the files that I want you to track. Okay, But you have to commit first. Okay, You have to basically uh, check in. So you have to say, you know, get, what was the command to actually check in the program? Is it CI? It's not commit, I think. Okay, man get. All right, so it's one of these commands. Get add, check out, nope, clean, clone, commit. I don't have an actual repository. GUI, init, log, maintenance, merge, move, notes, pull, push, rebase, reset, restore, nope, 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 stash. I think it's check CI for check in. But to do that, you need to specify commands and whatnot. OK, fine, we'll do it that way. So we're going to use a check in or commit. So get commit. So now it's going to complain you know, because I did not configure my username and you know, name here. This, you don't have to give it anything real, OK? Because unless you have an actual account on GitHub and you want to use the um, web resource, you don't have to do it this way. So you can just specify user.email someone at somewhere dot com. Yeah. Nope. Okay, what did I forget? Oh, the config does not need a two dash. Okay. There we go. And then we have to also config. Let me see if it will let me do it now. Commit. Nope, it still wants me to set up the username. <clears throat> okay, fine. So you set up username. Uh, user dot name. Yep, there we go. All right, so now it should let me check in. So you can see that I just gave you some bogus information. It doesn't. It doesn't know better, okay? You know, and you know, since I'm not actually using a remote repository for you know that needs to sign in, so this is fine. Uh, so I can now commit. So what commit does is now it's really adding it to quote unquote the repository, but this one is just local. So you have to comment. You have to give it the name like a description. It's like um, the initial version of the program. And then this is a nano, so I have to do a control X specify right. Okay, so now it's checked in. Now this is where the fun stuff begins. Okay, so I can go back and change the program again. Okay, so I go back to uh, swap.ttp asm, and I just go like, okay, let's do a little bit more of this program. Um, we do LDI a dot six plus <clears throat> decrement d st the oops the a jmpi to main halt and the main is here main has to return okay so ld bd increment d jmpb and oh forgot to initialize the stack pointer which is not needed but it's good to be there okay so now it just you know, add, I just added a few lines. Let's just say that I ran this program. Everything worked okay. It's the, the way it's supposed to. So now I can do a diff. Okay. So what I can do is to get do a diff, get diff, and then the uh, file that I want to look into. So now we can see that um, the no op is preserved. Okay. It is not highlighted, but I, I have just added these lines. So if I'm okay with these changes, I can commit again. So now I have two revisions saved in the repository. So what this allows me to do is every time I make sure the program works up to a certain point, I can check in. If later on I did something to mess it up entirely because I ate too much you know, turkey and I lost consciousness when I'm programming, then I can go back and use a diff tool and find out what exactly did I do? Oh, I deleted that line that is 
that really needs to be there, but I accidentally deleted the line. So that allows me to easily go back and check what I have done to the program, and I can make incremental changes to the program, knowing full well that I can revert back to an earlier version if I need to. Do you need to use this tool? The answer is no. Okay. The other way to do this is to save your file based on the date and the time. I will not just name you know, one, two, three, four, five because you're going you're gonna to lose track of you know, which one is the latest one. So whenever I want to save a backup of the program without using a get tool, I would use the date, which has to include the month and also the time as well, because you might be checking in multiple times. So you want to know, is this the morning version or is this the afternoon version or the, is this the evening version of two days ago? So you want to use you know, both the date and the time as a part of the file name if you want to maintain your know, versions of the program. If you do maintain versions of the program, you can use various tools to compare those versions. The most basic tool is called DIFF, just D-I-F-F. -F. I'm not sure whether Windows has it or not, but there are tools online as well. Just go, you know, use, use Google search, look for web DIFF, okay? And then you paste the content of one file into one window, you paste the content of the other file into the other window, and then it will analyze and show you what the changes are between those two versions. So that makes it easier for you to identify so what did I change that messed up the program? It used to work at least up to this point. Now it wouldn't even get to that point. What did I change? So this is how we work on the programs, you know, kind of gradually, because you, know, you cannot expect yourself to finish that program in one single go. So that means you have to break it up and basically do what I did earlier is to verify one step at a time to make sure that you are not, um, that everything that you build upon is already checked and verified. All right, any questions? All right, so if there are no questions, uh, you can go ahead and do the lab activity for today's lab. But I do have office hours today, tomorrow, Wednesday, and on Monday, I do not have office hour, but I'm typically in the office at 9.30ish or so. So if you stop by and I, I turn out to be in the office, I can help answer some questions if you do have any. And then over the weekend and over the holiday, you know, I do answer email, but you know, don't expect me to get back to you like right away. So maybe a day or so, you know, would be a reasonable amount of time of turning around. All right, any questions before I stop the recorder, the recording for today? No questions, so I'm going to stop the recording and upload it.